You're listening to TechNado. Welcome to another episode of TechNado. Quick reminder before we get started, TechNado is sponsored by ACI Learning, the folks behind IT Pro, and you can use that code TechNado30 for a discount on your IT Pro membership. I'm Sophie Goodwin, one of your hosts, and uh, I'm not alone here. I've got a dancing machine here to my left. He dancing was, machine? You were you were busting down for a second there. I don't know what she's talking about, ladies and gentlemen. She likes to make things up. You, you were dancing what? like Mr. Van Damme is what you were doing over there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you got me there. That was funny. I don't think I have such sweet dance moves right. as a one Mr. Jean-Claude Van Damme. I, I could nowhere come near it's his true. capability and skills I agree. around the dancing sphere. I agree. For some context, I watched Kickboxer for the first time last night, and it rocked my world in <laughs> as it does. a good way, maybe. I, I, I think, I, it, I, like it's, it threw me. It it's threw definitely me. an experience. It full yeah. There should be a ride about that movie. It is an experience. <laughs> yeah. Who, was who like, is the? What studio made Kickboxer? That's a good question. Because, because it needs a theme ride. Does Universal have park. the rights? Yeah. 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 Put it right next to the mummy. The Kickboxer it's, ride. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see this so, uh, at Disney, right? With animatronic Tong Po. That, <laughs> So if, you, if you've seen Kickboxer, we may talk about that a little bit this episode because I have some things to say about that movie. As you're moving through the ride, he's like uh, breaking his back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to drink. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll, uh, we'll we'll maybe get to that, but um, that's that's, that's some breaking news for you. I did see Kickboxer for the first time, and it changed my life. Uh, that's not the only breaking news we've got here. No, though. we have breaking news. We do have breaking, breaking news. news. Uh, yeah, this just in, if you will. So sometimes things happen. And we see that they happen. We don't miss it, right? We are keeping it up on the news and we're, we're checking you know, the sites and everything to see what's going on. There's just not enough information for us to really talk about it at length. So something happened uh, just yesterday. This broke. Uh, this group, Intel Broker, this hacker, Intel Broker, claims a space eyes breach targeting U.S. National's national security data. So uh, there's not any proof. This person went on and boasted that they did it. Oh, it only took 10 to 15 minutes. And supposedly, if, if it's true that this actually happened and they were successful, yeah, it would have significant repercussions for U.S. national security. But there's a lot of ifs. There's a lot of allegedly's. So it doesn't really make sense for us to, you know, yeah, talk and, about it. And, and uh, just to be sure, like, because we basically skimmed this article yeah, right before literally we started. five minutes ago, yeah. Like, this might be an important thing to just kind of mention that it did happen, uh, is that this is not a U.S. government agency that they... Right. It is a company, a private firm that does geospatial intelligence. Yeah. Intelligence, right? That basically their only client is the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So there's that. If it did take, I mean, it does seem to reason that it, if there is a hack involved, I mean, if you find an exploitable vector, it doesn't take long. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Once you exploit it. Yeah. You're kind of in at that point for the most part. I mean, it could be anyway. Sometimes you have to chain things together to, to, to get things to work or to get farther down the road. Maybe you didn't have as much access as you would like. But given the right circumstances, you hit the right tool, you hit the right thing, you hit the right exploit, and yeah. you're just like, everything the light touches, Simba, <laughs> is ours. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. that's how it works. It's, so it's it, possible that this occurs. And, of course, what is step one in the We Got Breached playbook, Sophia? Deny. Deny, deny, mm -hmm. deny. No proof. We have no information where there's no indication that we have been breached or that any of our records have been exposed. And then two weeks later, it's like, hey, do you remember when we said that? We were just joking. Yeah, I mean, just but, joking. but even though they they will admit, right, I was mm -hmm. just joking. I mean, they didn't get anything. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, they did get some stuff, but it was just like names yeah. and addresses. Nothing stuff. serious. They, they got the phone book from us. Big deal. Well, Big whoop. Maybe they got a few passwords, but nothing crazy. Yeah, they were, they were all, you know, all. encrypted. Right. Right. Like with like the weakest encryption possible. So. Oh, they have the encryption key. Mm, they did take yeah. that too. Yeah. So anyway. But that comes out weeks later. Right. That's weeks down. And the hopefully, road when, you know, a lot of times by that point, people have kind of moved on about from it. it. Yeah. So it kind of flies under the radar yeah. sometimes. But sometimes we do get comments like, hey, this happened this week. You guys didn't mention this. We Generally, we do see it. It's just, you know. We are literally yeah. looking at articles up to the, right before we go. Literally Let's start the tech NATO. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we just wanted to mention it. Uh, maybe we'll make that a new segment. Yeah. This just in, breaking news, kind of a thing. Something like that, yeah. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get a graphic spun up for that. But yeah. wanted to introduce that first. No we, transatlantic? I thought you were no, going to go, this oh, yeah. just breaking in. Breaking news, this just in. <laughs> Intel broker, if he is to be trusted, has breached sensitive data. More next yeah. week, maybe, hopefully. If you could keep that up the entire segment, that would be awesome. I would love to. I feel like I'd probably yeah. get, people would be like, that's annoying, get yes, her off the show. Please stop. But otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, I'd do it. I'm a voice actor. I like to work on that kind of that's stuff. True. It's fun. But uh, we do have other stories, other articles that we're going to be talking about here in our rapid fire segment. We'll try to go through them pretty quickly because we do have a decent amount to cover. Give our 
lukewarm takes, if you will. Uh, and then later on, we do have a bit of a deep dive that we're going to get into, a couple deep dives, in fact. So we'll start off with a, a pretty big one. Windows apps vulnerable to command injection via bat bad butt, which is a tongue twister in itself, flaw. And if we scroll down here, we can see uh, this has a severity score of 10. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, yeah. 10. That seems bad. That does seem pretty bad. Right? Bad, As bad, in, bad butt. Well, because, if I correct me if I'm wrong, I could be totally wrong here. The CVSS scoring goes from zero and ends at 10.0. That is the highest. Daniel, I believe it does. Yes. I believe yes. you are Judges, correct. Judges, yes. That, that is estimate. correct. Yes. yes. But it does say it's still a waiting analysis. When I go to the NIST page on it, um, it says the the base score for CNA is 10, critical. But okay. NIST has not given it its own score yet. So, But based on what we know right now, look at that base score of 10. It is critical. So moving through this... We see a 10 and... Not you know, only that, we, we you know, to... br bring that, bring your screen back yeah. up because I always like to look at uh, where the NIST score is, kind of zoom in there yeah. and look at the vector oh, no. mm -hmm. right there, vector. So you see that AV colon N, mm -hmm. that is means it's network, right? So that's the attack Got vector. Little... AC, which is the attack complexity, L for low. Oh boy. Right? Which means it's not that hard to pull off. Right. right? Yeah. That's uh that's like a big problem there. Yeah, you get a little pop up there. That's that's kind of nice, right? Privileges required are none. User interaction is none. Scope is changed. Confidentiality high, integrity high, availability high. That's why this hits the big one zero. Easy because, to pull off and big impact. Uh, it, it basically, you know, uh, a, a mildly sentient being could could probably make this happen. <laughs> you got a fish hacking yeah, the system. You, you could accidentally <laughs> lean on the keyboard. It's like, how did I get inside of? The <laughs> oh man, totally owned this box. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's uh, that's what we're looking at here. Anytime we see a, a perfect ten, we do tend to, to panic a little bit. But specifically, it says that uh, this uh, makes Windows apps vulnerable to a command injection. And command injections are, are pretty scary in and of themselves. That's right? that's exactly right. So I I came across this uh, uh, looking at this Rust blog. I saw this Rust blog. If you jump into my laptop, you can see the security advisory for the standard library of this of, of Rust. Rust is a programming language commonly being used. It's kind of like uh, all, all the prophets out there are saying it's going to be the one that takes over and and finally puts C and C plus plus to it plus to its bed mm -hmm. and Rust because it's got some security measures around it that those languages do not have. But in the standard library, they found, and it's not just for Rust, apparently. It, it, it affects Haskell and PHP and a couple other programming languages as well with this can't command injection. So if you have a file or a um, like a batch file, right, or anything that ends in CMD, the way that the standard library works the command, so this is the using the Windows API or the, uh, you know, the command API for Windows, you can see here, the way it handles arguments is not properly sanitized, and that's the issue. Then it's it's basically just, if you know how to do command injection at that point, if you're taking arguments to your to your batch files or where you're processing and running batch files or CMD files in through your Rust code, it'll go, cool, what else you got there? Yeah. It's not just the arguments. I can semicolon plus make a reverse shell plus add a user plus do whatever – Anything I can do from a command line, it will do. And if your program is running in the context of system, administrator, that kind of stuff, whatever the context in which that is running, it will have the permissions to do said thing. Actually, I think it all runs it at the highest level because Ooh. you are running uh, with the Windows API. Yeah, I think it is in kernel space. I, I, I'm, I'm not 100% on that, so uh, don't quote me, but... Does have some some mitigations for you, so I would definitely check that out if you're using any kind of Rust code or PHP. I don't even think PHP has an update for this yet. I don't think so. When I was looking through it, and maybe I'm wrong, I might have missed something, but it doesn't look like this is a situation where it's like, oh, there's a flaw, here's a patch, you should be good to go. Yeah. It's like, you can mitigate this, here's what you should do to try to prevent this from being an issue, but there's not like a fix per se. Yeah, so. and, that, and that's only for some of the languages, not all of them. Right, okay, gotcha. So, so keep an eye out, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The bat, big the deal. bat. Bad, bat, bad butt. Bat, that is yeah, good luck with that one. Bad, right? bat, bat, bad, 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 butt. Bat, bad, butt. It reminds me of a uh, Arrested Development, Bob, blah, blah, <laughs> of blah, blah, lawyers or something like that. That's what that reminds me of. Oh, it's like Job, right? His name, G O B, Gob. G yeah, Gob. Like, it looks like Gob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So funny. Oh, yeah. Well, we, uh, we do have, I know I mentioned we might introduce a new segment this just in. We've got an old favorite segment here up next, and this is going to be a bit of a double feature. This is Deja News. Deja News. 
We got it in the we got the music in the room. Yeah. We can have a little dance party. You can pull out your Van Damme moves. This first part of our Deja News segment today, you might remember we talked a little bit about a just a tiny little breach uh, with Microsoft several weeks ago. It had to do with you know Cozy Bear Operation Midnight Blizzard. Might have heard of it. Anyway, so. This just in, Microsoft Breach allowed Russian spies to steal emails from the U.S. government. So, kind of scary. Uh, let's take a look here. U.S. government's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency warns that the Russian spies who gained access were able to steal sensitive data from U.S. government emails. And anytime you see that, that's a little bit scarier than... I mean, it's it's bad enough when it's like private citizens' information, but that this has some more serious implications, I would think. Man, you got to love a good supply chain attack. Yeah. It really, really kicks you in the gut. Kicks you where it matters. Yeah, because, and especially when it involves the U.S. government, if you live <laughs> in the United States, yep. you, you kind of like are, are hoping, with fingers crossed, that the government can will keep you safe from foreign entities that want to harm us or destroy our way of life. The Russians seem to be quite at odds with us on these things. No. I know, it's weird. It's weird. You know, we've got to find some common ground there and, and, and fix this because we, yeah. we've got a lot of like warfare going on. So as we've reported before, and I'm sure that you've heard that the Microsoft um, certificate keys that were available to decrypt information got a, kind of got stolen through some, some crazy means. And then you got Microsoft kind of waving one hand on one side of things going, well, you know, it's not that bad. We And then on the other hand, we don't really know how they did that. All we know is it's fixed. Mm -hmm. and it's like, I mean, is it? And even if it is, the fact that we are now come uncovering, right? Here we are in, in uh, maybe phase two or moving into three of what happens when he, when a breach occurs. We admit only what we need to. And then it's like, well, here's, here's kind of the yeah. big deal of it. You have sensitive information. So they're basically... I think it was Microsoft or was it Sys? I think it was Sys. It was, te mm -hmm. was telling the government agencies that were affected by this, which are basically all of them, that you need to go through all the emails during that period, find out if there's any sensitive information that was that could have been gleaned, yeah. flag that, and let us know. So, and then, of course, if like you leaked a username and password or an API key or something like that, an encryption key, you now reset. have to revoke that stuff. Yeah. And generate new things, and you got to go through all this is going to be one heck of a process. Yeah. I do not envy that task. No, got to hit the reset button on a bunch of stuff. Got to like comb Hercule through. It's like Hercules' 12 tasks. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That right? is true. Uh, but yeah, they are going to ho hopefully, you know, take some some measures going forward. There was They had a quote from somebody uh, from Tenable, I think. They interviewed somebody from Tenable for some reason. I don't know what they have to do with this situation. But anyway. Well, Tenable is they like said, a, a large I know they're like a cybersecurity biz. Yeah, like a big deal. They make Nessus. But I don't, it wasn't like uh, they were directly affected or anything. I think they were just giving opinion They're probably just uh, looking for an commentary. expert, yeah. And it was like, I love the way they described it. Microsoft's lackadaisical security practices and negligent approach to disclosure have national security implications. I've never heard somebody use the word lackadaisical in a context. But in I love context. that term. I love it. I love that that's the word they chose to use. Not just that it was, you know, half-assed for lack of a better word. Yeah, lackadaisical yeah. is a much better word for that. Just, so, uh, uh, you know, we'll get to security when we get to it. What's the right. big hairy fire really about a, this? Not really a priority. Yeah. But yeah, I think especially for a company like Microsoft and the implication that, oh, it was U.S. government emails that were accessed. It's just not the best news for anybody involved. Well, and, so. and I would agree with the, I mean, historically we, mm -hmm. we see Microsoft when something happens that affects a Microsoft product, they love to just kind of be like, eh, did it really happen? Yeah. Yeah. Eh, I Are mean, sure it's not that? that bad. You sure about that? Like, I don't even know. They, they, they won't let employees use, I think, Again, correct me if I'm wrong. This is, oh yeah, like, you yeah. can't say that there was a breach or a compromise. Or There's whatever. like words that they are yeah they that they're not so. allowed to yeah. use. You can't say zero day or something like that. Yeah, they don't supposedly. I mean, why not? Yeah, <laughs> denying the fact that it exists does not mean right. it does not exist. Like, are you afraid you're going to speak it into existence or something? You're right. If like, you talk about it, it's weird. Well, it became bad PR. They admitted. If you don't admit mm. it, yeah, you know, it's like whatever. It's and I think that's why someone would go as far as to say, "Oh, Microsoft was lax a days ago." Yeah. Lackadaisical. Lackadaisical. Lackadaisical, yeah. yeah. They, they lax daisies, too, they but did. they are lackadaisical they are, would be the word. Lack of daisies. <laughs> well, uh, well, like I said, uh, this is actually a deja vu. We may see more on this yeah, in the yeah, future. Yeah. Hopefully, any developments in the future are not in the negative direction. Hopefully, it's like, hey, it's not as bad as we thought, but 
you know, if but history, it probably is. If history's taught probably us anything, worse than what we think. It's going to get worse. It's, <laughs> yeah. you know, not to speak into existence or anything. Yeah. But like I said, this is actually Deja News double feature. So this next one, you might remember, we also talked about another teeny tiny little breach uh, having to do with a small startup called AT&T. Uh, they're talking about this data breach. It's not a new one. It's the one that happened recently. But there's an update. They're now saying it impacted 51 million customers. And I mean, I can't really count, but that's a oh, man. that's a pretty big number, Daniel. You know, that, that just goes to show you how good their security was because mm-hmm. it was originally reported that it was like over 70 million. So they're uh, they're down 20 million. Mm-hmm. That seems like a lot. That's true. It says the leak contained information for more than mm-hmm. 70 million, but only 50 some odd million yeah, were affected. Yeah, they said some were like some of those uh, were duplicates. Or they didn't have sensitive data that were actually in the, the, you know, as part of the breach, there was like a name associated to it, but there was no real data. Mm -hmm. And the others were were duplicates. It's like, how do you have 20 million duplicates or empty rows? Yeah. Right. That seems seems like a lot. That's a little concerning. Yeah. That's a little odd. You guys, obviously, your IT department needs some help. <laughs> Neither of the T's in AT and T stand. Like for. you, you are storing almost. Okay, so let's see here. They said it was fifty-one million mm-hmm. down from seventy some odd million. So let's call it twenty-two million less. Sure. How much? How much percentage is twenty-two million of fifty? Good question. Right. I'm gonna go with it's like four sevenths. What percent is twenty-two of fifty? Forty-four percent. So forty-four percent. Mm-hmm. Right, that's weird. Why do you have forty four percent more data that does nothing for you? You yeah. guys should really like obvious. Like I said, obviously AT and T's IT department <laughs> they're lacking. They are. They need some help. Yeah, I mean yeah. with the job market being what it is, you yeah, know, they're hurting for people. It's like golly, yeah. you've got you've got forty four percent more data than you need. Yeah, yeah, it is a little bit. Is a, a little concerning would be an understatement, I guess. Yeah. Uh, as far as the data goes, though, as far as I can tell, this data is from June 2019 or earlier. They still have not, they've admitted there's been a breach. Yeah. But they're still like, we don't know how they got this data. It, I mean, it wasn't us. We have no idea where this came from or how they got a hold of it. Um, but uh, it may have included, they're not confirming, but it may have included full name, email address, mailing address, phone number, social security number, date of birth, AT&T account number, and AT&T passcode. So uh, a lot of information. May have, may have may included. Have. They're being very vague. They don't. You know. They're hedging their bets. They're hedging their bets. Right? You're not um, committal language. But if I hear that somebody may have my social security number, that's probably still going to freak me out. Yeah, I'm. I'm. A, well, good news, right? The good news is AT and T said, well, you know, we'll give you free credit monitoring for a year. Oh, thank God. Oh man. <laughs> oh, wait, didn't this happen in 2019? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like if this data is that old, the breach. Pro- itself is probably you know i mean the the information was right. leaked recently but how long has it been exposed and you mentioned that they're under class action lawsuits because of this right yes yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and there was there was another breach that happened previously or another um or no i guess it was a data throttling thing at and is dealing with a lot of stuff right now oh yeah, they, yeah they're having to pay out money for a data throttling thing from like back in 2019 and now they're dealing with i think with a class this. action lawsuit from this so <laughs> they're straight up not having a good time right now now nah. uh, so i guess pray for at&t <laughs> that their security gets better or something yeah that they do uh, better stop yeah Doing Do it better. this way. Do better. I'm going to have a bad time. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Mr. Mackey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, moving into a different company that's kind of having a bad time right now. iPhone users in 92 countries are being targeted by mercenary spyware attacks. So, Apple has issued iPhone security alerts to these countries, stating their devices have been targeted. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, one of the countries that is affected pretty heavily by this is India. And India has been pretty outspoken before about they do not like those security alerts from Apple that makes them angry. They just don't want security alerts? The, uh, the Indian government opposes the security alerts by Apple, but they are pretty heavily affected by this Why? issue. That's a really good question. Uh, let's see if I can find some more information on that. But for whatever reason, they are... Oh, political firestorm in India. So this is from a while ago. Uh, it's caused tension with the government, questioning the claims and pressuring Apple to soften them. So this this issue between India and Apple appears to go back. If you've got information on it, let me know. That is um, just a weird thing. That like, if if there is a security issue that affects my device, and the company just kind of like gives me a, mm-hmm. a little push notification. I By think, the way, yeah. you probably want to update, patch, do whatever, or just be on the lookout for you. you there's heavy, you know, activity okay. when it comes to. The, these devices, you might want to be on the lookout. Be just be diligent, yeah. vigilant. I guess so. It says uh, this again 
previously the reason that India's government was up in arms about this. It triggered strong reaction with the government because they accused Apple of interfering in their internal affairs and questioned the accuracy of the warnings. They were saying, like, it might not even be that big of a deal. So they're saying this is like election interference or something. Right. Yeah, that it's yeah. causing issues and it's it's causing interference in their political affairs. So gotcha. whether or not that's true, I have no idea. But <laughs> so so they would rather it's that. So this is, uh, you know, when things just get way too politicized mm-hmm. is like when a company can't tell you, by the way, we got some like jacked up security flaws. You probably want to. <laughs> be on the lookout for because you're more concerned stuff. man about- or there's like a real threat actor out there going haywire mm-hmm. uh attacking things just just fyi but hey if you want us to blacklist that and just never talk to you about this again that's cool we can yep. be like that i mean if i'm apple and you don't want how how, how i guess they would have to geo geo like uh geolocate where those devices are yeah in, yeah in some way through ip or um gps or something well, and in this case, the, I mean, it's mercenary attacks, which I guess is, is basically a targeted spyware attack. And so this article does say that journalists and activists in jurisdictions of risk tend to be targeted. NSO so, group. Right. Exactly. Right? And then so, the Pegasus, that's the first thing that pops in my head. They're, they're not the only game in town, but sure. they're kind of like the, the ballers on the block. Uh, when it comes to this, they, they specialize in having specifically for Apple devices mm-hmm. because Apple typically has fairly good security. Sure. On yeah. their on their mobile devices, they a decent reputation. In they're that, very in that very tight, very sandboxed, very controlled. They they pride themselves on keeping those devices secure. That doesn't mean they they win that battle all the time. And obviously, zero days unless they are reported to Apple for remediation are are going to continue to plague them. So that's the uh, things like the NSO group. What they do is they hire very skilled hackers to develop zero day exploits for that platform. Right. And then they can sell their Pegasus product to say, it doesn't matter. Well, you can be on the latest and greatest, most patched version of iOS. We still got you. Yeah. And that's what makes it very appealing to people like Saudi Arabia to say they, they, they're very, um, how do I, how do I do this in a PC way? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> They're not huge fans when people talk bad about them. Yeah. And they like to discuss that further with those that find them to be objectionable. And maybe they'll talk to them about that forever. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the implications of this, so a targeted mercenary spyware attack in this case, could remotely access sensitive data, communications, even the camera and microphone. Yeah. And that is scary. I mean, it, even if I was, you know, the target here, it looks like would be, you're more likely to be targeted if you're a journalist or an activist in a jurisdiction where there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, where you're at higher risk. But even just, I'm not, I'm not a journalist. I'm not an activist in any way. But that would scare me. Like, they might have access to my camera, my microphone. They could access my data and communications. That's just, you know, you you feel you feel dirty. It's like a breach of your privacy. It's a breach yeah. of your information. So, uh, so it is it is scary stuff. Uh, but Apple's issued a warning for this very reason because it is scary stuff. And that's basically what a mercenary attack is: is a targeted spyware attack. So right. Uh, if you were a loved one, it's unclear whether it affects U.S. iPhone owners. And so I think probably a good portion of our audience is in the U.S., but other countries, you can go over and look at that at the list of, of the countries they've issued the warnings to. And uh, I don't know if you're a journalist or an activist in one of those countries, you, you might want to uh, just just watch your back a little bit. You know, be, be careful and take those security alerts seriously, especially because Apple does have a pretty good reputation when it comes to their mobile security. Now, uh, this next one, unless you've got more to contribute on the Apple mercenary issue. That but, seems uh, uh, pretty straightforward pretty on that straightforward. one. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. This next one is, it's one of my favorite segments because we love to see cyber criminals get their justice. This is Behind Bars. Break the law and you'll you break go the law, you go to jail. jail. There was well, a, we hope so. We hope so. Yeah. We do hope so. Most That's of the, the idea. time. We hope. I can't even say most of the time. We hope you go to jail yeah. if you break the law. Former depends on where you're at. It depends. You are, right? It depends on the crime, <laughs> yeah. right? But in this case, there was a former security engineer sentenced to prison because he was hacking crypto exchanges. This was in prison, 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 prison. Uh, I believe for I don't know, at least a couple of years. But he, yes, three years. Former Amazon engineer, an ex Amazon engineer. Uh, oh, yeah, this guy. <laughs> He defrauded a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange of roughly nine million dollars, and that's no small potatoes. That's As a lot do, of money, right? As you La- do. Last yeah. time I checked, that was the whole purpose of crypto exchanges was so that someone could defraud them. It's the one benefit. And steal like <laughs> that <laughs> seems to be the only thing that happens with these things. They amass a bunch of crypto money, and then someone comes in and, and absconds away with it. Yeah. 
and then we go, oh, that, that sucked. That's the one great thing about crypto. It's easy to steal. But hey, so, they caught this guy. They caught this guy. Yeah. Sentenced to three years for hacking and defrauding uh, from New York, New York. He was actually arrested in July, pleaded guilty in December. So he was just sentenced. But this has been ongoing for a bit. I love how, so as I read this article, he the the gentleman in question, I can't, I don't know if they named him. Uh, uh, Ahmed? Shakib Ahmed. Yeah. So Shakib, he, he saw himself as more of helping than he did hurting. Mm. Because he would he would hack these crypto exchanges and take all the money and then go, hey, I was easily able to hack and take all this money. That seems like a security problem. I'll give it back to you for a bounty yeah. of X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. And like one company paid him out, another company didn't, so he just took the money. Well, they didn't, uh, there's something. this company, Nirvana, they were going to pay him money. They were going to pay him over half a million dollars, but that wasn't enough for him. He wanted oh, 1.4 million. Yeah. So he ended up just saying no deal and keeping all yeah, the assets. Yeah, he's just keeping all the money. Yeah. So, so it's like, it wasn't enough for him, that's, half a that's million. That's not how it works. I don't I don't break into a jewelry store, steal all the jewels, and then contact the <laughs> Let owner. Let keep a necklace. We and call that <laughs> crime, <Yeah>. not, <laughs> right. <laughs> that, is a, that is a crime. You have to have authorization yeah. from those people to do said thing before you engage in said activities. Right. Otherwise, you are what's known as a criminal. Well, and even if you had, like, even if this guy was a pen tester and he had authorization to do this, you wouldn't steal the money. You maybe have authorization to go looking for these, for, for like, a flaw or a way that you could... That you could break stuff. Yeah, even if you did, if you did steal the money, you would steal like a little bit. Right. To I from, guess from, to show from an that... account that was there for you to quote unquote right. steal the money. You would not be like stealing. Everything would be set up for you to prove that you could steal money if you wanted sure. to. Sure. Yeah, but you wouldn't be stealing nine million dollars. Right. <laughs> and then going, well, I'll give it to you back if you give me a million bucks. Yeah. Yeah, that's... And, and again, they would be in on this. Right. They would be like... It's a group project. Yes, you have, like, where you sit down with people and then paperwork is signed, legal term. This is why you're going to jail. <laughs> yeah. Because, fun fact, if you accidentally pen test somebody's stuff, like, they, they, they might not care that it was an accident. Yeah, that's right? true. You will go to jail or you might get prosecuted. You, you will, you'll have a tough time yeah. explaining... And their sanctions might come might come down the road on yeah. your head. So just be aware of that. That's why when you do a, a sit down talk with uh, pr prospective clients or even people that have signed up for clients, you do scoping, you do statements of work, you do RO, you you do all sorts of paperwork. Sure. Before the facts, and in that scope, and plus the, even let's let's say this right. Let's say that. Sophia, you decided uh, you needed a pen test and you've hired my firm sure. to pen test for you. We sit down, I go, cool, what's in scope? You give me your production servers and maybe some test servers or whatever the case is that you want scoped. I got IP addresses, I got domain names. I, as the pen tester, still have to verify that those belong to you because you can't even accidentally give me permission to hack something that you don't own. Right, yeah. Right? Then we're well, both in I, trouble. I, yeah, I can't pull up my... my my statement of work and, and uh, all, all that and go, look, well, she said it was okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. She doesn't have authorization to say it was okay. Right. I can't give you permission to break into my neighbor's house. Correct. It doesn't work that way. Right. So if you accidentally put that in your scope and I just go, well, it's in my statement. Yeah. That doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. We're both in trouble. Right. We No, you're not in trouble at all. Oh, really? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. No, the onus so the is on the pens. You. That's right. Mm. That's exactly right. Mm. So, yeah. That's Good how to know. it works. So, uh, so anyway, like I said, he's uh, supposedly an ex-Amazon engineer. The only the only thing that's been released in court documents was that he worked at an international technology company. They didn't name the company, but you go to his LinkedIn profile, it says he worked at he Amazon. He says I work at Amazon. Right. It's <laughs> like, okay, they didn't name it. It's not hard to find. You know, that's that's OSINT at work right yeah. there. Just go look at LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah, I went to <laughs> LinkedIn.com. So he was sentenced to three years in prison. In addition to that, sentenced to three years of supervised release, as well as uh, ordered to forfeit approximately $12.3 million and pay over $5 million in restitution for the victim cryptocurrency change exchanges. So he is out quite a bit of money, and he's going to do some time. But if you can't do the crime, you can't do the time, don't do the crime. That's, that's how what it works. Is. That's, 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 that's what, what they say. If you can't do the Stand crime, the heat, get out of the kitchen. Exactly. Right? So, uh, yeah, you know, God, God bless God bless the legal system, I guess, for catching this guy. Sometimes it works, <laughs> Every right? Every now and then, right? We Sometimes get to, it we works. We get a win. We like a win. And he's going to serve it. his time. Uh, this next one, though, this is uh, another one that's a little bit concerning. Uh, CISA, 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 however you want to pronounce it, urges immediate credential reset after CISense breach. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. CISense, CISense. 
I don't know. We'll find out. Somebody will correct me, and we will find out. So uh, they've disclosed a breach affecting, this is a business analytics provider, this company, and they're telling all these customers, you better reset your credentials because you might be in trouble. So a little bit concerning, just just slightly, just slightly. Just a little bit, yeah, because they do, like uh, like you said, data analytics. Mm -hmm. But I, if I'm not mistaken, they do a lot of data analytics for, like, the government. Yes. Right? So you go, hey, here's my big data, like stuff that's really hard for us to kind of parse through and collate and figure out what everything means. So I sense they go, we'll, we'll handle that for you. We, we've got the AI and ML utilities that can, uh, you know, easify that for you. And now they had like a big breach. Yeah. And that is a problem because there's all sorts of really good info. Like, I mean, think about it. They have like data lakes, right? These are, mm -hmm. these are huge piles of data. And now attackers have had access to said data. And I don't know if you know this, but that's like a big deal nowadays. That is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. When hackers have access to, to any kind of data that they shouldn't have. But supposedly this was, as far as they can tell, uh, company information that was on a restricted access server. Which doesn't have. Did they great... say how they got initial access. So uh, Brian Krebs on on his website had kind of released some information, and supposedly sources with knowledge of the breach said it appears to have started when attackers gained access to the company's GitLab code repo, and in that repo, a token or credential gave the bad guys See, but access. That's not the, the initial access is how they get into that GitLab repo. Right. Okay. Right? That's initial access. That's a good question. Because all the other sensitive stuff was behind. Right. Right, was behind that. That it doesn't say. It just right, says that they gained access and then they got a token or credential uh, that gave them access to their S3 buckets in the cloud. But as far as their actual access to the, Git, right. the GitHub repo, doesn't say how they got right. access If it was an open S3 bucket, we'd all be sitting there going, morons. Yeah, yeah you right? can't. You know. But it, so far, without that piece of information, so that's really the linchpin behind this is, what was it? Did they use initial access broker? Were they able to you know, send a, 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 a convincing fish to somebody? And they clicked and so on and so forth. And that was uh, like, what was the way in which they found themselves into that GitLab repo where all the gold was? Yeah. Because that's what, that's where the metal meets the meat when it comes to like, how do I, uh, if, if I was SciSense, what would I do to secure this so this wouldn't happen again? Right. Right. Do we need to do remediation training when it comes to end user awareness or, you know, was there a hard coded cred somewhere? Like what happened here? That's, that's what I want to know. Well, at his uh, his website, Krebs on Security, he says uh, it appears to have started when the attackers somehow gained access. So they don't know yet. And there, there is a, a decent magic. amount. For, <laughs> yeah, through, yeah. Whoa, there magic. Uh, there is a decent amount of like apparently, allegedly still. So we know that something happened. But as far as the information that was exfiltrated, uh, says attackers used the S3 access to copy and exfiltrate several terabytes worth of SciSense customer data, which apparently included millions of access tokens, email account passwords, and even SSL certificates. So if that's true, that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. That is a big problem. You're going to have a bad It's also a problem that I keep smacking the mic. That is also a big problem. I'll have to do something Don't about that. Don't smack the mic, okay? If you uh, smack the mic, you're bad. <laughs> So, uh, you know, Mr. Mackey now. That, good. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad. I don't like, no, I'll just make you think of those sweet Van Damme dance I was going to say. In you, a Thai <laughs> bar. It's, mm. you need to start doing the, the Van Damme accent. That's, that's the voice you need to start doing. Yeah. Or it, that's you, happening. It might, yeah. I don't know. I think if you practiced it, you could probably, probably get it down. Yeah. So this may be another one that pops up again, uh, when more information starts to come out about this, about what exactly, uh, what data exactly was Yeah, I can't wait to see how that happened. That's what I'm going to be interested in. Because there are, yeah. The implications are not great. Yep. Uh, we're getting ready to wrap up our rapid fire segment. Though. We got one more, and we're going to go deeper on this in our deep test segment as well. But probably wondering, what about that Palo Alto uh, vulnerability? That was a, that was a perfect ten. Well, perfect is a strong word. Yeah. But uh, yes, Palo Alto Networks released an urgent fix or urgent fixes for an exploited PanOS vulnerability. So it was a perfect ten, a CVSS score of ten. And uh, let me see if I can pull up the the report on that or the uh, breakdown of that vulnerability because uh, you know how we were looking before at like yeah, yeah, the yeah. attack vector and stuff. I want to see if I can pull that up. But uh, say case of command injection, and that's always oh, command injection yeah. again. Oh, those right. are fun, right? Deja vu, right? And we are finding command injections all over the place. I I, I saw someone talking. Uh, it was either on LinkedIn or something where they were saying it's just like 2024 is the year of the breach. Mm -hmm. It's just been so bad when it comes to RCEs this year. Like everybody's RCE, RCE this, RCE that. We've had a, quite a few tens already this year, and we're only four months into the thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we if it continues on this this vector, we're gonna have a, a really, really, really bad year. But command injection, they found a place where you're taking user inputs, and from there, it's being processed on the back end, 
to to run a command like a system or operating system command you're using some sort of like eval or os or system or whatever the case is in the underlying language to kind of lean on this the operating system itself to do x y or z function instead of mm -hmm. like building like rebuilding the the wheel you, you just go hey the operating system can do this run that for me would you but if you're not checking for specific characters and sanitizing that stuff out and really watching what's coming in, well, you got to remember it's feeding it to the operating system. My five feet operating system. Have you ever heard of a thing called a one liner? Mm -mm. And that's where you string commands together using oh, characters. Yeah. Like I have one command that I that I delimit to the next command by using a character like a semicolon or two semicolons okay, yeah. or an ampersand or a pipe character where I'm just moving, okay, move from one thing to the next. And there's different ways of doing that. But ultimately, if I can build this one thing and feed it to the machine and the machine goes, cool, you you gave me the command. I'll run said command. That's why this is such a big deal. Yeah. And and I looked at the, uh, I was able to find the breakdown of like the metrics and stuff. It looks almost identical to the one that we talked about earlier, the bad, but bad, bad, whatever it was yeah. as far as the metrics go. Triple B. <laughs> uh, low complexity, high confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, attack vector was through the network. network. Yeah. So very similar, which makes sense because that was also a command injection issue, Correct. right? So. Yep. Uh, but definitely a, a big deal. Huge, if you will. And we are going to go a little bit deeper into what this actually was and, and kind of how it works. Uh, and I know that it was Volexity, I think, that that ended up finding this, mm -hmm. identifying activity that it is a zero day or it was a zero day. So uh, there, there's fixes that have been released. But um, outside of that, you know, outside of deep dive material, anything else that's like surface level that we should cover kind of in our rapid fire segment before we get too deep in the weeds? Well, we'll just to give you the, the bells and whistles. A, it was obviously, it was, they found a flaw in the Pan OS and some specific versions that allowed for command injection. From there, a threat actor, so this is actively or being exploited. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of the big problems that, that's occurring right now. Uh, I believe they are Midnight uh, Eclipse, Operation Midnight Eclipse. That's happening, so that's... That is um, the activity that is being tracked by uh, Palo Alto Networks Unit 42, their security f uh, branch of mm -hmm. Palo Alto. Uh, uh, like you said, it was Velexity that discovered that this was happening and that the uh, Operation Midnight Eclipse, they actually have built a Python-based uh, malware to kind of help them do this in real life lands to continue the campaign. So that's okay. those are the highlights yeah, but like you said, we're gonna we're gonna kind of dive a little deeper into this when we come back. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, so if you were just wanting kind of the the gist of it, if you just wanted the surface level stuff, there you go. But we are gonna get deeper into this uh, when we come back. We are gonna take a short break, collect ourselves, and I'm gonna think some more about the movie Kickboxer and how it's changed my life. But stick with us through that break, and we'll be back with a deep dive here on Technado. Tired of trying to schedule your team's time around in-person learning? Isn't it a bummer to spend thousands of dollars on travel for professional development? What if we said you can save money and time and still provide your team with the best training possible? The answer to your woes is live online training from ACI Learning. With live online training, we provide our top in-person courses in private, online, instructor-led formats. You get to provide professional development in a manner that fits today's expectations. Entertaining, convenient, and effective. Our exam-aligned courses inspire the full potential of your team. Visit virtual instructor-led training at ACI Learning for more info. Welcome back for more Technado. Thanks for sticking with us through that break. As promised, we are My going. Band, damn, damn. I was I was gonna say you were you were busting it down yeah. over there. Okay, okay, Bust, busting open some moves. I felt like I was in a Thai bar, just drunk as Cooter Brown. <laughs> that's a no, southern no, 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 no. colloquialism right there. The Perriers, the Perriers. Did. That's right. Get him a Perrier. Uh, that's get what him did a Perrier. it. Perrier. That's funny. Uh, know, good, sparkling good water call. off good the. Call. Yeah, that's he's a... off the water, which is you know that'll yeah. do crazy things to you. Well, like I said, we did promise we were going to go a little bit deeper into that uh, Palo Alto vulnerability, that Palo Alto uh, command injection issue, which is so much fun. Uh, we already talked about how that is a perfect 10 uh, on the CVSS. Perfect is a strong word. That's right. It's but, the uh, Carrie Scrug. The ca oh. <laughs> okay. You're not sure. familiar with her? I don't think so. She was a gymnast in the Olympics in oh. like, the 90s, and she, I okay. think she hit a perfect 10 with a, like, a broken ankle. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, good for her. See, yeah. if it's not a gator gymnast, I probably don't know. Yeah. I'm I'm very pigeonholed into the Gator Athletics world. Mary Lou Retton, uh, yeah, familiar. Nope. She was like one of the first gymnasts to get a perfect ten. Oh, good for her. Yeah, I'm happy for her. She walked so Simone Biles could run, or something sure. like that. Yeah. Anyway. 
Palo Alto. We'll go, we'll go back to this one. Uh, we have a couple different articles we're going to pull from. Uh, as we mentioned, Velexity is actually the, the group that discovered this, that there was a actively being exploited issue. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at uh, Palo Alto's site as well, their Unit 42 kind of breakdown of this. We have a little bit of a, a figure here that we're going to show that breaks down uh, how this malware works. Uh, and so I love the little images that they show us. Maybe you can kind of walk us through this, Daniel. Sure thing, right? Because uh, that's what the the deep dive is all about. Learning a little bit more about this so that we can better understand how our, those attackers out there are operating and what we can do to kind of like figure out what we can do to stop that. So it's always interesting to to see the workflow. And like you said, Velexity has a great graphic that kind of breaks down how this how this actually uh, is accomplished. So let's jump in here. Let's take a look. So it starts off here, right? A, with a, re a web request, which is a get request to a specific pattern 404, adding a command to the error log, right? From there, this thing reads, so we got the command injection, which will start uh, the ability to actually inf um, infiltrate, infect the system with the malware, which reads the error log. That's, that's happening right around here. It'll retrieve commands via pattern, Remove, and then if we move over here, it'll decode that. So these are all encoded. We're going to get into a little more details here. So I'll just kind of give us the overview of how this is working. So it'll decode and execute that command. That command output will then be pushed back over here and saved to the output or save that command output to a file. It will then bah, 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 retrieve results. So the attacker is now going to retrieve those results. Go back to uh, step eight, which will remove the command from the log file. We want to leave no trace that we were here. Creative. Right? Yeah. And actually, as we kind of get into the details on how, what's going on in that step, very interesting, very smart. Yeah. Very crafty, right? Yeah. The, the crafty suckers that did this. The, is this the, the, the midnight? Midnight eclipse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was, was crafty. Under cover of dark. Right? And then finally, it waits 15 seconds to restore the original CSS file, which is kind of what it's manipulating here. So very cool. As you can see, it's that bootstrap min.css. So once all that is done, then we have successful, basically, C2 operations with our malware if we were Midnight Eclipse. It wasn't so evil. I'd respect it. No. But it is evil. These are the bad guys. And uh, Palo Alto, like I said, they're Unit 42. They've got uh, a good breakdown, I feel like, of what this actually does. They kind of put it all in one sentence. Enables an unauthenticated attacker, which is never good. To execute arbitrary code with root privileges. And Seems any, like a problem. Anytime we yeah, see root privileges, absolutely a problem. that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, root privileges on the firewall. So they, they get some details on the vulnerability, and then they go into the scope of the attack and kind of break it down line by line what's happening. So what is happening? Yeah. So let's start off here, right? It says, as a part of the activity observed in the operation Midnight Eclipse, after exploitation, the threat actor creates a cron job. Not familiar with cron jobs, they are cool little basically scheduled tasks inside of Unix Linux operating systems. That's how they work. If you're coming from Windows world, this is going to be that that's scheduled task area. So a lot of fun and not really a difficult thing to do, but obviously a very useful thing. So what does that tell me? It tells me that if I'm a threat hunter, if I'm a defender, one of the things that I need to be looking into is regularly looking for changes made to my cron. So I need to be alerted when cron activity occurs so that I can go, is that authorized, is that authorized? Because if I'm not looking for a cron job to be changed in any shape or form, that should not be happening. That should only be done after a change request and all the, the, the specific types of management that you do. So if you're monitoring your cron jobs, then that, that'll go a long way because as you can see, that is being utilized. And I, I, I've done it myself to maintain persistence. I make cron jobs that reach back out. So if the system is rebooted or I get disconnected for any reason, then it will just kind of reach back out because con I can sell, schedule a cron job to run like every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month of every year. Mm. And then I can just wait for that good old shell to pop back in. So cron jobs. So it's using WGETs. And as we can see, like right here, We've got this QO, right? WGET QO. So the dash Q is telling it to be quiet. The the big O is saying, hey, output that to the terminal. And then the dash is kind of like, I believe that's telling it to kind of like feed that as output or input to the, the command line. And then, of course, it gives the IP address of the malicious server. And it's looking for the endpoint of slash policy and then piping that into the bash system. So bash run this. So basically they're taking this and W getting a command that works as a command string into bash. 
Mm. It did say that it was unable to access the commands that were executed via this URL, but we believe this URL was used um, to deploy a second Python-based backdoor, which our colleagues at Velocity refer to as UpStyle. So Ooh. that's that's the the second backdoor is called UpStyle. The UpStyle backdoor uh, uploaded the, to the firewall was hosted at, and it gives you that update.py uh, with the IP address for that. But we saw a similar backdoor at this URL, which is uh, obviously being hosted in Amazon, as you can see from US West 2. There's an S3, US West 2, Amazon, AWS.com. <laughs> kind of hard to, it's it's much more difficult. That That's really a, a good tradecraft right there because it's really difficult to block. You, you, you're you going to block AWS.com? Right, exactly. Amazon, AWS, especially if you're using Amazon, AWS for things, which is a high probability that you are. Mm -hmm makes it much more difficult. Plus it also kind of like uh, bypasses any kind of scrutiny when it comes to, if you have like a web application firewall, hey, this is good traffic because it's coming from AWS. So they're they're kind of like using that as camouflage. It doesn't raise any red flags looking at it. It's okay, that especially like you said, if you are using AWS for, right. for stuff, then okay, that's normal, moving on. And and you probably pass it over without giving it a second thought. That's exactly right. That's that's the idea. That's the intent. Yeah, so. The yes. stealth. They are creative. Like I said, if they weren't evil, I, I would respect them. Uh, and so it, it says the uh, appears the attacker in the, in this instance last modified on April seventh, twenty twenty four. Now you have been talking about uh, how they they go in and they like change the timestamp and they stomp out any evidence they were there, and that to me is very creative. I think that's a very interesting way to go about this. Yeah, they they were super creative, and and honestly, this isn't super difficult to do because they had such an ease of command injection for the Pan OS that's that's running here that they just built this in Python and were like, eh, let's see, this is simple. We like it this way. So they just built a Python script that built, grabs more Python scripts and builds more Python scripts and basically just uses Python. Python is a very easy language to kind of get under your belt. So if you wanted to write effective malware that's not difficult to kind of code up, Python is a great language in which to do it. And if you've got full access to the system, well, then everything's just going to work like a charm because Python's installed on most Linux-based things. Right. Right, because we, we like to run Python. But in that, it does, uh, the, the first update.py writes another Python script to the following location, sites, uh, site desk packages, system.pth, right? It says this Python script written to system.pth, base64 encodes an embedded Python script and executes it. Yay. We do love to see some base64 encoding. This is common. I was at uh, B-Sides not too long ago, and I, I was asking some developers, do we see regular developers like just base64 encoding a bunch of stuff? I know I do it for the purposes of getting around and being obfuscation uh, or doing obfuscation and, and being stealthy. You can't just easily look and see. You just see some base64 encoded. And I'm like, would that in and of itself not be? Because the only reason I, I base64 encode stuff is for the purposes of, well, I do it for two reasons. To make it easy inside of the... Uh, sometimes using single quotes and double quotes. And when there's multiples of those mm -hmm. inside of like a block of code, it can get really like janky right. and kind of break on you. So you just base 64 and code that whole thing and go, here you go. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore. And once it decodes it, it can then run all that stuff without a problem. So that's what, reason one, why I would do that. Reason two, it's good for obfuscation. You can't just look at it and see that it's something malicious. It's a base 64 encoded string. Mm. And they were like, yeah, coders do it all the time. For like one of the reasons that I was saying, it can get really janky trying to build, uh, you know, command structure. Sure. You want it to do stuff when you have a bunch of different like nested um, single quotes and double quotes going on inside of your your code. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we see this a lot for both the reasons of obfuscation and just coders like to do this. So it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a thing. But they are obviously doing it for this. Right. You can use it for good or evil. But in this case, it's, it's obviously not being used for, for a great purpose. Uh, and it, it, this this file has multiple layers. So this is really just the first part of what happens, right? That's exactly right. Once it decodes all that, that Base64 encoded badness, it says the Python script run uh, by system.pth has a function, Dunder main, with, that will run in a thread. This function first reads the contents of the following file, and it goes for the bootstrap.min.css, which we saw in the graphic from Velexity, right? Then it enters an infinite loop, uh, it iterates once every two seconds, reading the following file, which is SSLVPN underscore NGX underscore error.log. 
and it is looking for a certain thing, and it is using this endpoints here with what looks to be some regular expression. And if you scrutinize this regular expression a little bit, you can tell that it's looking for base 64, mm -hmm. right? And base 64, because it's looking for characters A through Z, upper and lowercase. It's looking for characters zero through nine. It's looking for the plus character and the equals character. And oh, also the forward slash character, right? Those are all the characters that are used within base 64. Mm, okay. So it's saying, hey, if you regex on this, then you know you found base 64, and that's exactly what I'm looking for, right? It says the above regular expression matches. Base 64 contents will be decoded, and the command will be run. Yay! The lines of the SSL uh, ngx error.log file that do not match the regular expression are written back to the file. So it's basically going, okay, I wrote something bad into this log file. I now need to remove that uh -huh. so that there is no indicator of compromise from that vector. So they're cleaning up after themselves. They're cleaning up. They're covering their tracks. Smart. As they were. And I think they even changed the timestamp of uh, the original as huh. well. As you can see, yeah, it, it'll run these functions called restore. Restore function takes the original content of the bootstrap min.css file, as well as the original access and modify times, sleeps for 15 seconds, and writes the original contents back and changes the modify times to the original times. Very, very good tradecraft there. So once that's done, honestly, they've they've got that back door kind of running. It's got a slightly different URL for we observed the threat actor running another command to receive commands from a slightly different URL as the cron job back door. So just different variations on a theme here. So you, you just want to kind of grab these IOCs. And if you're running a Palo Alto uh, device that has these Pan OS's versions that are susceptible to this, this is definitely something you're going to do with your threat hunting. And there were several hotfixes released for those versions of PanOS that were affected. So basically what Palo Alto is encouraging people to do is strongly advising them to immediately update to a fixed version of whatever operating system you're running, whatever uh, PanOS you're running, whatever version. So it's good to know that they, they were super quick about getting a fix or a couple fixes released for this issue. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, people are seeing that notice and, and if they are affected, yeah. getting that update. Yeah, I think both the Velexity uh, and, of course, all the links are in the description down below. Mm -hmm. So if you want to kind of check this out, I think both uh, Velexity and Palo Alto Unit 42 have, like, mitigations, workaround fixes, and, and are kind of keeping you up to date on these two pages on what you should be doing if this is a problem for you. Yeah, absolutely. We like to we like to end our deep dives on that note. How and, you know, ask your doctor if yeah. this is if this solution is right for you. Give you a little bit of a fix or a little bit of hope that uh, they, they have released some fixes for this. Now we do have another deep dive. We're going to get into another one that might have popped up on your radar this week. Uh, this one we're going to pull from uh, it's Clarity, I believe is how you pronounce that. They're the ones that, that have kind of been covering this. Uh, Clarity. Clarity. <laughs> yeah. Cl yeah. Blood clotty. Clarity. Yeah, that's right. Put the right uh, emphasis on this. the syllable. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, so they uh, they've got this uh, this breakdown here unpacking the blackjack groups, Fuchsnet yes. malware. We will call it Fuchsnet. That is how we are choosing to pronounce it. Even though it's it. based, it's the idea is similar to Stuxnet. Mm -hmm. That's what we have with Fuchsnet. We Again, don't Fuchsnet. <laughs> we don't want this video to get taken down. So. No, no, we're trying to keep it friendly here. <laughs> keep it for the kids. That's you right. Know, yeah. You're muffed for me, kids. <laughs> kids that are following along well, with I a breakdown. Malware. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, th this one, uh, you know, obviously Stuxnet, I'm, I'm at least somewhat familiar with, but this particular one, Fuchsnet, I didn't have a chance to go as deep on this one. So what was it about this one that stood out to you? So what I thought was cool about this, I say cool. I mean, it's just something. It's something different. We mm -hmm. don't see this. Every day, you know, we obviously when we do deep dives, it's typically about malware or a specific breach. And obviously, and this is a breach, and but it's it's against systems that we don't see every day, especially with this level of detail, because the what is it, RUXFIL um, site or hackers, uh, they are they're quite verbose about what's going on. They're kind of blasting it on the airwaves. They actually have a website that you can go to. Uh, if you want to see that, it's right here. Ruxfil.com forward slash Moss. And if I click on that, let me kind of let that pop up. Here's all the data that they found in a very simple, the Moss Collector Takedown, 9th of April, 2024. And they're going after Russia's industrial sensor and monitoring infrastructure. And they have apparently successfully disabled it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, proof, quote unquote, in here. 
where you can click on uh, access to 112 uh, or the 112 emergency services. I think that's like their our our 91 their version of our 911 is 112. I guess in Russia, 87,000 sensors and controls have been disabled, including airports, subways, gas pipelines, etc., etc., etc. They have a couple of YouTube videos showing that they were able to uh, accomplish the upload of their malware. Um, it's, it's just very interesting. The fact that this is against ICS, SCADA, critical infrastructure, that is something you do not see every day. Well, it does say that at least these folks were not able to confirm all of the attackers' claims or whether it has had a, a big impact on the Russian government's emergency response capabilities, because that was, I guess, the end goal here. But they were able to kind of go in and break down the the malware itself, the Fuchsnet malware, uh, and the claims that, that were made. So they don't have 100% concrete proof that this Correct. happened, but based on those claims, it's it's kind of scary. Yeah, it's and it's, it's just really interesting. And uh, I thought that Clarity did a really good job of kind of walking you through. So if you're new to the ICS, the SCAD, of the OT world, this is, and it's something that maybe is on your horizons as far as like security wise, this article is going to point out a lot of the reasons why those industries are rife for attack and the, uh, the fallout that can occur due to that because of the systems that are being taken after. So Again, let's take a look at some of the claims that are included in this hack. They say they gained access to the emergency services number. They were hacking and bricking sensors and controllers in critical infrastructure, including airports, right? Uh, We saw subways, gas pipelines, all of which have been disabled. What do these sensors do? All sorts of stuff. And they're meant for safety purposes usually. Or are they, a lot of them are. Let's put it that way. Yeah, fire alarms, things like that. Right. If, if nothing's being reported. Now, if you go back to the idea of Stuxnet, if you're not familiar with Stuxnet, it was a, I think, a collaboration between the U.S. and Israel to damage or defeat the Iranian nuclear program. This happened quite a few years ago at this point, but they were able to destroy uh, nuclear centrifuges that are, are critical in the production of useful plutonium and uranium for nuclear production, mm-hmm. right, no, yeah. of, of nuclear weapons. They were able to destroy those things, and they they modified the sensors to not report back the fact that something was wrong. They reported back all is normal. I believe that's that's kind of what they're going with here. Well, actually, they just did a lot of disabling, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, because it says right here, disabled network appliances such as routers and firewall, deleted servers, workstations. This was scorched earth, right? They just went, let's just kill everything. I don't care if they know about it. 30 terabytes of data that was wiped, including backup drives. They disabled the Moss Collector office building. All key cards have been invalidated and dumping passwords from multiple internal servers. So, like I said, this was kind of a scorched earth approach, and they had these proof uh, things. Like, I really like their <laughs> – so they have this this uh, kind of ace of spades Buddy hacker. Oh, thing going I on, see. Right? I was like, that's clever. That's kind of neat. Yeah, because they're called Blackjack. Ah, right? I see. That's the, that's the hacking group. So that's a really cool logo. Good for them. But this was proof that they were able to hack into and successfully take over mm. a, a terminal in one of these buildings. Now, I don't want to I don't want to say anything too controversial here because I know some of this is still up up for question. But if this is something that, you know, uh, these alarm systems are being affected, things like fire alarms, right? It's supposed to alert you if there's a fire in the building. Let's just say, for example, that's affected. You're not alerted to a fire. People could die. Does this count as cyber terrorism? So they're in the middle of a of an actual hot war. So I don't know. That's that's a tough one. It's just an act of war at that point. Yeah, I guess it depends on what side of the fence you're standing on. That's true. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. Because because the way that I understood cyber terrorism is like if it causes harm to human life and limb, then but I guess it does depend on how you're looking. Yeah. Like I said, I don't want to. Ter- like- terrorism is usually done when you're not in hot conflict with each other. Right. It's kind okay. of uh, I uh, we're we're not a state. I think that these. Is Blackjack a state-sponsored? Good question. You know, I don't know. I, I, I didn't see whether or not they were a state-sponsored, but typically... Believed to be affiliated with Ukrainian intelligence services. Well, believed to go. be. Yeah. So, okay. Go. Okay, so, I see. Because of its close association with the Ukrainian government, going after critical infrastructure of the Russian government, right? This seems more of just cyber warfare, which is another interesting point that, that kind of comes up from this article is that this is the horizon of warfare. Yeah. Right? We are seeing that, well, yes, they are shooting guns and bombs and, and sure. all that other stuff, and which is which is horrible, 
they're also being a, they're going after this those um, uh, digital right battlefields. Right, you can't discount cyber attacks yeah. in that context because it can be just as bad. You know, it can have it can also have serious effects. Yeah. And this isn't the first time we've seen this in this conflict either. Mm -hmm. So we have to expect that as we move forward from this date and time. That doesn't matter what warfare that is going to occur, any kind of conflict that happens, you have to expect it to to bleed over into critical infrastructure yeah. to to see attacks coming in that 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 is no longer like well you know that's that's that could happen but probably won't it's it's a it's a more likely than not at this point I think and they did go into detail about a lot of the different devices that were targeted or that may have been affected uh, but then also it says uh, when one connects to the gateways via SSH they're greeted with a notice that includes default username and password the attackers release JSON files with information about these gateways including uh, device types and names IP addresses communication ports so a lot of information that was available that they so, so showed. I, I love this part right so if you if the, these devices have SSH enabled on them so there there's problem number one Right. Problem number one. Sophia, can you answer for a thousand points? Critical infrastructure. I thought it was supposed to be air gapped. How are they gaining access to these things? Well, yeah, I mean, if it's something like this, you shouldn't you shouldn't be able to access it through the Internet. Right. I Correct. Mean, in, in ding, most ding, cases. ding, 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 yeah. ding. They connected it to the Internet. Mm. That's the problem. I, I think that they were using like a specific IoT router that has like 3G, 4G connectivity. Mm -hmm. So it has like cellular capabilities, which gives it access to public networks. I wonder why? I wonder what the motivation was there. So why that you they... can remotely administer these things yeah. so that you don't have to go out into the field. It's all about like ease, ease of, of administration. Yeah. Yes, ease of administration. Sliding scale. Aye, it comes back every time, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, it's always there. So that was step one of of problems and then there was uh, other ways in which they were like uh, they were connected to networks that were connected to the internet which gave people access to step two just by the fact that i'm going to try to connect to it it gives me a banner with the username and password which are default which they were able to successfully leverage to gain access into these devices yeah that's a problem so we're connecting iot or not iot i'm sorry ot and technically, I guess IoT as well, or IIoT, I guess it is, uh, devices to OT, SCADA, ICS systems to the internet. Problem number one. Problem number two, we're using defaults, right? Mm -hmm. Hello? Like, don't do that. That's that's just lowest level security yeah. that you could think of is just change those default usernames and passwords so you can't just gain access to them. This group was looking for... Uh, Internet exposed IRZ devices. They use Shodan, which is something that oh, we yeah. have used before on like shows and stuff. Yep. Discovered thousands of devices, most of which are located in Russia, and currently around 4,100 IRZ routers that expose their services to the internet directly. And of those, around 500 of them enable Telnet. And I thought Telnet was like, you don't use Telnet if you don't have to. Nope. That is like, you stay away from Telnet at this point. Yeah. Well, that just goes to show you like how the critical infrastructure, OT, ICS, SCADA systems, a lot of them are developed without security in mind because who's going to touch this and i believe the like the mbus mm. uh communications protocol that uh these are the sensors right here that some of these sensors utilize are like they they don't really have any kind of encryption or security built into them right so it's easy to just once you connect you start throwing commands at the thing and it goes okay mm -hmm. i'll do that I, I i found this one to be quite interesting right here this is a gas analyzer that uh, looks for like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, yeah. um, uh, oxygen, and something else. I forget which what, what what's in there, but uh, yeah, and it reports back whether or not those are too high, too low, whatever the case is, hmm. and and then can alert the end user, the administrator, to a problem. Yeah, that that doesn't seem bad. Yeah, if that's not working, then that's, yeah. that's bad news. Oh yeah, here it is right here. They got a big close up of it, of uh, all in Russian. I don't uh, CH four CO two. Uh, CO and O2. So oxygen, carbon dioxide, and that is CH4 is... Something, something hydrogen. Carbon monoxide, or is that CO? No, that's CO. Yeah. Um, let's look for the common name. CH4 is methane. Methane, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's another, uh, um, just, I think some of these are, obviously these are sensors, and there was also like uh, RTUs, remote terminal units, that they were able to gain access to. So... 
Mm. Really, really uh, big time. So this is a temperature and humidity sensor. Converts the physical values of temperature and humidity into a digital signal and transmits them to the sensor gateway. So I think that was one of the big things that we can learn while... You might not agree with the politics. Uh, I'm, I'm removing the politics from this and right. just, just looking at the security yeah. of this. And that's what's interesting. How they were able to basically cripple their their critical infrastructure with SSH, Shodan, yeah. and some really well-crafted scripts that yeah. just said kind of destroy these things. They, I think they destroyed the, the NAND chips that are on a lot of these things. That's the uh, non-volatile memory so even if you lose power, it continues to hold information. And they just wrote those chips over and over and over and over and over again until they were unwritable anymore because they only have so many read writes before they, before they go bye-bye. But that's not typical that you would do a lot of rewriting from those chips. So they should last a very, very long time. Their script said, nah, I got a better idea. How about we write a lot? Mm. I mean, a lot, lot. And then once it stopped responding, I'm like, cool, I guess you don't work no more. And it bricked the device. Or they would flood the network with uh, information and requests, basically denial of servicing it. And then they would turn off all the remote services. So even if it was fixable, you can't log in to fix it. Right. Right. So lots of, like I said, it was a scorched earth policy of what was going on. And then they, so much that was released with the, if you go to the RU uh, XFIL site. Yeah. You can kind of scrub through and look at a lot of the PNGs and, and the JSON data that they released in passwords, usernames, all sorts of data dump going on in there. To have free access to that kind of stuff is just really interesting uh, to be able to look at this. We can see some of the uh, JSON information. So uh, 424 devices that use the MPSB, the sensor gateway. Then you got the sensor gateway in the modem. That was 93 devices. The 3G router, 93 devices. Some Windows 10, Windows 7, and Windows XP workstations. <laughs> Only one device. Only one. Only just one. Probably runs, it's probably the main server. Yeah. <laughs> That's the right. big target. This is the big dog right yeah. here. If that XP system goes down, <laughs> we are hosed. Because I guess, yeah, that, I mean, truthfully, that is the case sometimes with uh, with this critical critical infrastructure stuff is that it runs on older systems, right? Because yeah. to, to update or upgrade would require you to like shut everything down, right? So yeah. you can't really do that, which is why things are air-gapped usually, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because if they go down, things go bad. And another interesting thing, we got a screenshot here, and you can look at this in that you can actually see screenshots of how, like, I don't read Russian, obviously, but they're kind of giving you some idea of this is the Kanansky district right here. And it looks like they've got Cisco. It looks like a, uh, some type of server or something that's going on here. We've got some IP phones maybe and things that are just, you, you normally wouldn't be able to see this kind of stuff, but because they made all this public, you now have access and you can look and see what this kind of data breach looks like. This is something that uh, I do want to mention again. They make sure to say that Blackjack's alleged attack against Moss Collector, other than the information leaked by the hacker, them, the hacker himself, herself, itself, they self. and <laughs> yeah, themselves, themselves, they themselves, yeah. uh, and published reports from Ukrainian media, they can't 100% confirm but they were able to go and analyze this Fuchsnet malware because that that does exist. That is a thing. Um, and, and there may be more details about this that come out in, in the coming weeks or months. And hopefully it's not anything terrible. I mean, yeah, but yeah. but but removing any of the, the, the political politics absence. from it, yeah, yeah. just technically, this is an interesting thing to look at. This it's is... really interesting. So I would I would definitely look through some of those um, screen captures and data uh, information on the uh, Moss website there. So to definitely check that out. There's a lot of it already here mm -hmm. in this specific article. So if you don't want to go over there, you, you don't have to. A lot of it is uh, within the uh, Clarity article. Yeah. They, they, they make sure to put all the really cool bits in there for you. And of course, breaking down how it works and like destroying the NAND chips. And they show you some code where it's basically just doing bit flipping mm -hmm. to make that occur. Uh, destroying volumes of the the, the actual file, uh, the File systems themselves. File system goes bye bye. Hard time doing anything, right? You're gonna have a bad time. Yeah, you're gonna have a bad time. So you can kind of look at these uh, pieces of code that make this happen. We got the denial of service. You start to look at some of the actual devices themselves and the serial buses. So it's just all really cool stuff. Uh, we we could never go too deep into this. This, this would be yeah. like a series of technados yeah. really tackling this, but kind of giving you the high 
high level with some detail bits mm -hmm. to get you flying and, and really cool stuff. And all this stuff is, of course, in the description. So if you do want to go in and really get into the nitty gritty of it and the details, those article links will be available there for you. Uh, and this is Clarity again. Thanks to them for, for breaking this down. But uh, but yeah, hopefully you enjoyed, you know, some of these deeper dives that we do here on Technado, um, especially that Palo Alto one, because it is something that that was huge news this week. I feel like I saw yeah. that everywhere. So hopefully you enjoyed. Uh, if you missed last week's episode, we were actually at the Kennedy Space Center at HackspaceCon. That was a lot of fun, but we are glad to be back home in our home studio, I guess. The the Dawn studio. The Dawn for... Studio Don is what they call it, I guess. Uh, studio Don. In loving memory. The Technado Studio. He's not dead. He's just not here right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll pour one out <laughs> Like a Don. banner. Yeah. <laughs> a moment of silence for Don. Yeah. Uh, maybe he'll be back at some point. We, we I'm hope sure, to have yeah, him. we'll have him on. It's just he's a busy guy. But he's we, like super busy. Crazy. Crazy busy. So we hope that we can have him back on at some point uh, as, a, as a special guest here on Technado. All right, wrap uh, it up. But yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up because we've taken enough of your time. Thank you so much for sticking with us through this episode. Once again, don't forget you can use that code TECHNATO30 for a discount on your IT Pro membership. Thanks to our sponsor, ACI Learning. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next week for more TECHNATO. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's show, consider subscribing so you'll never miss a new episode.